Gentlemen, the President of the United States. Please be seated. I have a brief opening statement besides saying good evening. One week ago today in London, I joined the leaders of six major industrialized democracies for the annual economic summit, and we met to take the pulse of the world economy to measure the impact of the policies that we've been implementing during the past three years and to continue strengthening the freedom, prosperity, and peace that we share. Change comes neither easily nor quickly in foreign affairs, but there was recognition in London that while we continue to face pressing challenges, we are on the right track. By working together, by sticking to our policies, we've made impressive progress since 1981. The Western democracies have been moving from weakness to strength, from disappointment and pessimism to confidence and hope for a better future. In 1981, our economies had an average growth of only 1.8% and 8.5% inflation. But led by the recovery and now the expansion in the United States, our average growth today is up to 4% while inflation has been cut in half. There was recognition that the incentives of America's recovery program, which sparked our economic takeoff and the creation of more than 6 million jobs in the last 18 months, have made a major contribution to the improvement in both the performance and the outlook for the world economy. I reaffirm to our allies America's bedrock commitment to the NATO alliance and to its mission to protect peace and freedom in the West. Europe and America have enjoyed nearly 40 years of peace. If NATO remains strong and unified, and I believe NATO is stronger and more unified today than ever before, then Europe and America will remain free and secure. We have reestablished strength and confidence stretching beyond America's shores to Europe and the Pacific Basin. And we're trying as well to promote a better, more realistic long-term relationship with the Soviet Union. And that's why we and our allies have made so many initiatives to reduce nuclear arsenals, ban chemical weapons, break the impasse in the East-West conventional force negotiations, curb nuclear proliferation, and reach agreement on proposals for increasing confidence and reducing the risk of surprise attack in Europe. The West is doing its utmost, but to date, we have met with continued Soviet unwillingness to return to the nuclear arms negotiating tables. America is standing taller in the world today, but if we're to continue on course toward a more prosperous, peaceful world, then we need the full cooperation of the Congress. The Congress must support our strategic modernization program to keep America strong and convince the Soviets it is in their best interest to choose the course of negotiation, not confrontation, so we can safely reduce arms while preserving peace and stability. The Congress must pass the recommendations of the Bipartisan Commission on Central America and the two supplemental requests now before it to promote democracy, economic development, and greater security in that vital region to our South. And the Congress must promptly pass our deficit reduction program to help ensure that our economic recovery remains strong. And now, uh, Helen, you're number one. Mr. President, no matter what you say you've done so far, two Republican leaders don't think you've done enough. And they are urging you to hold regular summit meetings for fear we'll blow each other up with the Soviets without any conditions as to issues or outcome. Both you and the Soviets have said you will go to a summit if it's carefully prepared. My question is, uh, where do we stand now? Are you willing to go for a uh, summit to uh, start the ball rolling? Well, Helen, in the first place, with regard to the two senators, and I did talk to them, they were talking about a, a goal that would be desirable uh, that uh, I think we all share. And uh, we were agreed on that, and I told them some of the difficulties and problems that we've been having. But yes, I am willing to uh, meet and talk any time. Uh, so far, uh, uh, they have been the ones not responding, but we have kept in communication. Uh, there are a number of issues, other than arms uh, reductions, that we uh, 
have suggested talking to them about, and we're going to continue in the area of quiet diplomacy to, to bring that about. Are you going to make an affirmative move for a summit and, and to try to clear away some of these uh, stumbling blocks that have really caused great East-West tensions? Well, this is what I meant uh, with my remarks, that we are uh, continuing to uh, keep communication with the idea leading toward that very thing. So. Mr. President, um, do, do we understand you to say that you're willing now to drop your long-held view that a summit would have to be carefully prepared in advance and hold the prospect for reasonable success? Well, it wouldn't really be necessary for me to drop that since the Russians say that that's exactly what they feel must happen before there can be a meeting, uh, that uh, it must be carefully prepared. And let me, let me explain maybe a little more fully what, when I say that, what I have in mind. I, there have been a couple of times in the past in which uh, representatives from the free world and from our own country have gotten into things simply to get acquainted or say hello. And they have led to great expectations and they've led to great disappointment. And I don't think that we ought to go into something of that kind. But I, at the same time, I'm not talking about oh, a pre-constructed meeting in which you've got a list of points. You're, you can have an agenda in which it is the general area of the things that you think could lead to better understanding. And uh, that's, that's good enough for me. But right now, uh, we're getting uh, a response from them that they want a very uh, carefully prepared agenda. Now, if they agree with me that there are things we can talk about that might clear the air and create a better understanding between us, uh, that's fine. Follow up. Are you willing to take steps now to begin the process of working out an agenda so that the summit could ultimately occur? Well, we we are taking steps. We're this is what I mean by quiet diplomacy, and uh, I have been in communication myself, uh, a written communication. Uh, the Soviet leadership. There is one thing that I think. I've said this before, but that I think many of you uh, fail to, to recognize, and that is there have been three Russian heads of state uh, since I became president. Uh, one of them I knew personally. Uh, the second one was uh, we now know in ill health because he was virtually incommunicado uh, to anyone uh, during his period, and now this newest one, uh, is setting up uh, an administration and so forth. So it isn't as if we've been sitting here for three and a half years arguing with someone or uh, not arguing with someone. Uh, there have been a lot of changes over there. But uh, we're ready, willing, and able. Yeah. Uh, Mr. President, nearly a year ago, you said that you wanted to get to the bottom of the matter of the so-called briefing papers that went from the Carter White House into your 1980 campaign. I wonder, sir, if in that year you have ever talked to Mr. Baker and to Mr. Casey and asked them precisely what their roles were in that matter. Yes, and I think they're easily understandable. One has no recollection, and I can understand that from a campaign of something that might have come through his office and, and uh, been passed on. That, that goes on. I think there is one thing that ought to be cleared up about this whole case. And I did give orders to the FBI to make this investigation thorough, and I made order, gave orders to all of our people to cooperate to the fullest extent, and they did. And the Justice Department and the FBI were satisfied that there was no uh, criminal intent of any kind. But the thing that I want to make clear is we still keep calling it the briefing book. Now, it was established quite a while ago that the so-called debate briefing book, the Carter team, never has been in our possession that all that was uncovered were some position papers, the type of things that were uh, issues during the campaign, and all of it had been uh, out in the open and made public and and in the, as the campaign went on uh, before the debate. But the briefing book, if you will remember, the briefing book, it was pointed out, finally someone located on the other side, and there it was, and no one on this side ever saw it, nor was it ever in our hands. If I may follow up, sir, there, there still seems, however, to be some conflict in the matter because although the Justice Department said no crime had been committed, 
a Democratic-controlled uh, committee on the Hill says, suggests that there may have been a crime committed. In view of the fact that there is this conflict, the Democrats don't believe your Justice Department and the Republicans don't believe the Democratic Committee, wouldn't it be better to have a special prosecutor to resolve the matter once and for all? Well, that matter is in the court now, and uh, if that is decided by the court, uh, I will give the same orders with regard to cooperation. Frankly, based on that Democratic Committee report, it didn't make any sense at all. This has been investigated thoroughly. Sam? Sir, in recent speeches this year about the Soviets, you have held out an olive branch to them, but at the same time, you usually either denounce their system or their actions. Would it be better, in an attempt to get this dialogue started again, whether at the summit or back in Geneva, if you simply held out the olive branch without also taking a shot at them? Well, I don't think I've gone out of my way to just call them names or anything. I've usually pointed uh, to something that uh, is counter to their protestations of uh, wanting peace and cooperation, such as walking away from the arms talks. Uh, uh, I don't think that I've said anything that was as uh, fiery as them referring to the funeral service for the unknown soldier as a militaristic orgy. Uh, if we're going to talk about comparisons of rhetoric, they've topped me in spades. Leslie? Uh, Sorry. Uh, if I you you know, you, you shorten the number of questions we get in with all these follow-ups. All right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Anytime. I don't know if everyone else is left as unclear as I am on where we stand with the summit with the Soviets. Are you inviting Mr. Chinyanko to come and have a summit with you? And are you willing to have your advisors sit down with his advisors to work out uh, the, the pre-planning that you both say is necessary? No, we have been in contact with them on a number of issues that we think uh, bilateral issues that should be discussed between us. Uh, of course, there is the matter of the, of the arms talks also, although we've not been talking about that since uh, they have simply walked away. Um, all I can tell you is that in what I call quiet diplomacy, we are in contact with their people trying to establish a basis for, for talks. Is this an invitation, though? What? Is, is this an invitation? We, we haven't reached that point yet. <laughs> um, I'd like to join Leslie in not being quite sure here. Um, there seems to be a, a change or something that we have at least not known before. Your communication with the Soviet leadership, has that been with Mr. Chernyenko? And what has, has the subject been, a summit, a meeting between you and Mr. Chernyenko? No, the, much of the communication has been simply on the broad relationship between our two countries, and my communication by writing has been with Mr. Chineko. If I could just follow up, would you be willing to meet with Mr. Sorry, Sam. <laughs> I, he's much more gentleman. Uh, if, are, would you be willing to meet with Mr. Chernyenko even if he won't send his delegation back to the nuclear arms talks? Yes. Yes, I'm willing to meet with him. Chris? Mr. President, you have said recently that you think that U.S.-Soviet relations would improve in a second Reagan term. But several other people who have been in Moscow quote officials there as saying that isn't true, that they're not going to ever deal with you. They feel you have been too harsh. Uh, what hard evidence do you have that relations would improve after the election? Well, I've been too harsh. Maybe if I apologize for shooting down the KAL 707 and... Uh, some things like that, that maybe they'll they'll warm up and be willing to talk. Uh, no, I I think it's very obvious that, uh, and I wouldn't expect them to do anything that might help me in the coming election. But I I think when it's over and they know that four years lie out ahead, uh, if I'm here for four years, I think they'll talk. Well, that brings up the question: Do you think that the Soviets could get a better deal from your Democratic opponent than they could from you? Oh, I'm not going to comment on that. I, uh, yeah. President, as I recall, one of your previous formulations about a summit was that you would have to have something concrete to show for it. Are you willing to have a summit that does not have a concrete agreement or piece of paper like the New Salt or START Treaty or some uh, new, new initiative toward a Salt or START Treaty? Well, Lars, I've never thought about a specific of that kind. As I've said, there should be an, an agenda, a subject that both sides want to talk about and have some desire to get a settlement. And... Uh, 
there, that holds out the promise then that something might be accomplished. Uh, when you don't plan that well, if I could recall, and I don't mean this to be critical of uh, my predecessors, but there was a, there was a get acquainted meeting with uh, Lyndon Johnson, and it was nothing more than that. Then there was a meeting with Kennedy and Khrushchev, and it didn't ease tensions or make things any better. This was the meeting in Vienna. Uh, it led to even more strains. So it is a two-edged sword, such a meeting, Yes, you want to accomplish something, but you want to be sure that uh, you aren't going to lead to more trouble. My point was you're willing to have a summit that does not end in the signing of a treaty on arms control. Oh, yes. I, I've said that once already here. Yes. Sir. What is your time frame on this? If you are now willing to negotiate the possibility of a summit, do you think it could be held before the election? Whenever the conditions that lead to having one uh, would be fine. But one thing, let me say and make clear, I'm not going to play political games with this subject and go rushing out for some kind of political advantage to announce that I have asked for a summit meeting. Uh, that wouldn't do either one of us any good and certainly wouldn't be fair uh, to them. But this is legitimate. We, The door is open and uh, every once in a while we're standing in the doorway seeing if anyone's coming up the steps. I couldn't give you one. Right. Mr. President, some of you advisors are saying privately that the Soviet leadership now is actually so divided and uncertain that there's really not much hope of progress at this time. And you've seemed to hint that when you say that there have been three leaders since you've been in office. Is that your view, and what are the implications of that? Well, we don't know. There is, uh, there's been the theory advanced that uh, they're kind of marking time and uh, and perhaps in some disagreement about what course they should follow. But uh, there's no way to know that. So we just keep on trying. Mr. President, if I could get back to political games for a second. Uh, former President Carter said uh, uh, earlier this month that, uh, that uh, despite your statements generally in favor of a debate uh, with your <clears throat> opponent, that he thinks you're going to duck your Democratic opponent and we'll never uh, face him in a face-to-face -face debate. Now that former Vice President Walter Mondale is the apparent Democratic nominee, can you now promise that you will uh, participate in a uh, presidential debate with him? President Carter said that I would hide. There he goes again. <laughs> I, I would look forward to a debate. <laughs> Mr. President, today the uh, uh, Chief Kremlin spokesman said, we want to have negotiations with the United States in a whole complex of issues, which is certainly something different than Mr. Chernyenko said the day before. Do you read this as a change in, in uh, uh, Soviet uh, policy or tactics? Is there something going on there that, that, that is happening very quickly uh, uh, in relation between our two countries? We'll, we'll give them, we'll take a chance in finding out uh, on that because, as I say, we are in communication. And uh, uh, if they're ready to talk, uh, uh, we are too. Mr. President, do you interpret the Supreme Court decision this week in the Memphis firefighters case as the death knell of affirmative action of, as we have known it in hiring and promotion? No, I don't think that at all. I think the Supreme Court was interpreting, uh, giving an interpretation of what the law actually says. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I think in the discussion up came the point that back when, the, when that was being discussed, uh, Hubert Humphrey in the debate in the Senate said that the law did not provide for quotas. The law is to prevent discrimination against individuals. And uh, this was what the Supreme Court has said in that case. Uh, right. President, uh, last year you set in action a commission on organized crime. Could you tell me why, as the first part of a two-part question, why this commission refuses to say whether it will, is investigating Louis Farrakhan 
despite seven Hanafi Muslims and Malcolm X being shot by Mr. Farrakhan's accomplices. I would have no way of knowing, but a commission that is engaged in a study, I'm quite sure that they're not going to uh, talk about things that they are currently doing. I think the, the very nature of that kind of, an, of investigation would indicate that uh, they will report when they have everything wrapped up and tied up and uh, all the evidence that they need for any conclusions they come to. Follow up, sir. Um, in your setting up this commission under George Kaufman of New York, uh, you specified drugs. Are you at all concerned about Bob Woodward's reports of widespread cocaine use at the Washington Post, or do you kind of shove it off and explaining it, uh, that this illustrates uh, a lot about why the Post publishes some of the things that it does? <laughs> I only say in with regard to that question is that you are tempting me beyond my strength. <laughs> you noted in your opening remarks uh, the debate on the Hill about the deficit reduction package. Given some problems we're having with the spending side, but not on the tax side, would you be willing to sign a tax package without a spending package attached? Only if I had assurance that the spending package was coming along. Uh, there would be no point in the other. This triad that was worked out, this three-legged stool of domestic spending, defense cuts that we finally agreed to, and uh, some changes, some reforms in the tax structure that closed some certain loopholes and so forth, this has to go together. I made the mistake of going along with the tax increase in the guise of the same kind of uh, treatment on the promise of cuts that I never then obtained and the deficit would be considerably smaller if I had gotten those cuts that I had asked for. This time I'm going to be pretty sure. Does that, that mean then you might want to want them to wait from sending a tax package up until they've actually completed the spending? No, as I say, if, if there is assurance that the appropriation bills are going to uh, come up, that they're working on that also, I'm prepared to, uh, uh, to look them in the eye and then say, all right. <laughs> and, Wait. Yes. Mr. President, you and your campaign organization have spent a lot of time trying to increase your support among Hispanic voters, yet you continue to support the controversial immigration bill on the Hill now. Will that not hurt you with Hispanic voters in the fall? Well, I know that there are people, I can understand their concern and their fear. I think that if we take every precaution we can in that immigration bill to make sure that there is not discrimination simply based on the uh, not wanting to bother as to whether an individual is legal or not. Uh, I think we can protect against that. But the simple truth is that we've lost control of our own borders, and no nation can do that and survive. And I think the thing that they should be looking at that should be of the greatest appeal to them is the very generous amnesty that all the way up to 1982 we are ready to give those people permanent residency. Mr. President, you've said tonight that you're ready and willing to talk to the Soviets, but Mr. Chenyenko has proposed negotiating a ban on anti-satellite weapons and other space weapons. Can you tell us uh, why, beyond the fact that you believe there can't be verification, as you said last weekend, why can't verification be negotiated once you sit down with the Soviets to discuss those weapons? Well, there are a number of things, and we are studying that. We don't have a flat no on that yet. We're studying that whole situation. The Soviets are way ahead of us in that field. They've been at this for about 10 years or more. And uh, we are just in the field of, of beginning research. And we, I think we've got some uh, definite reasons there for wanting to know our way before we, uh, before we talk. But we, we haven't slammed the door on that at all. Can you also confirm reports about the verification issue that there has been significant Soviet violations of all of the treaties going back to 1958? We turned over a 200-page report to the Congress that was classified. We made public a summary of that, uh, declassified in the summary. The other uh, and lengthy report is still classified because 
of the risk of exposing sources. But it was a report on outright violations of many of the treaties in the past, and also some ambiguities in which, maybe based on language differences or not, uh, they claim a different interpretation of the treaty and that therefore they're not violating it. They have this, uh, uh, they're doing what they think the treaty prescribes. But between those two things, uh, yes, there have been those violations. Mr. President, uh, before you came along uh, in, in recent years, the talk uh, had been between the two governments of parity in, in force in, uh, between the United States and the Soviet Union. Uh, your supporters who wrote the 1980 Republican platform called for military superiority over the Soviet Union. It's been a little bit fuzzy since, although you in a couple of speeches, I think starting with the Star Wars speech, have gone back to uh, using the parlance of, uh, of parody. Uh, how do you feel the Republican platform this year should handle that issue? And between those two key words, superiority and parody, uh, where should that platform go and your administration go? My own view is that we should, we should maintain the strength and deterrent that is necessary to assure as much as you can have such assurance that uh, there won't be uh, a confrontation because the price would be too high. But at the same time, emphasizing that we want more than anything else to join with them in reducing the number of weapons. We've had arms limitation uh, dealings and treaties and so forth, even such as the SALT treaties. All of those simply legalized an arms race. They were limitations or rules and regulations as to how many more weapons you could have. As a matter of fact, the Soviet Union added almost 4,000 warheads after the two sides had signed the SALT II agreement. That's not my idea of what we really need if we're to reduce the tensions in the world. What we need is to reduce and hopefully to eliminate the strategic nuclear weapons. Follow up. If you're on record, I think at least twice of saying that we do not seek anything more than parity in, in the long run. Uh, would not a platform that uh, goes further than, than that and repeats the call for superiority uh, give a wrong signal to the Soviet Union? Uh, I would prefer that we not ask for superiority now that we've entered into and started this whole area. We are negotiating with them, with other countries, in two negotiations that are going on that they did not leave or walk away from. And uh, uh, yes, I believe that it could be counterproductive now to ask for that. Uh, Mr. President, if you win a second term, are you absolutely committed to serving all four years? I ask the question only because a Washington Magazine report, and I don't know how they knew, that you and the First Lady had discussed the possibility of, if you win again, and if the economy's in good shape when you're 75 or 76 years old, possibly turning over power, have you ever thought about that? Have you considered it or discussed with the First Lady that in any case? What the devil would a young fellow like me do if I quit the job? Uh, you have not discussed it with the what? First Lady? No, there's never been any, any such talk at all. Uh, Mr. President. Mr. President, uh, there, there is a move afoot in the uh, Congress that had the support of many of the Democratic presidential candidates to change the federal civil rights law to prohibit job discrimination against homosexuals. Is that something that you would favor? Now, I was so, you're gonna have to start again here for the first few words I missed them. I was so confused about uh, three there's, of you. There's a, measure before the, there's a measure before the Congress to change the federal civil rights law to specifically prohibit job discrimination against homosexuals. Is that something that you would favor? Well, I just have to say I am opposed to discrimination. Period. But well, would you now, support the measure, Mr. President? But, would you support that measure, I, putting I it in? Seen it. I want to see what they, what else they have there. Uh, no, Mr. Right. You. Mr. President, um, the current report said that the United States is moving to its two societies, one black and one white, separate them equal. Now, with the outcries from blacks, Hispanics, American Indians, and women against your civil rights policies, aren't you moving this country to its two separate societies, one of white males and the other of blacks, Hispanics, American Indians, and women separate and unequal? I don't believe there's been any violation of either the letter or the spirit of the civil rights laws, nor would I stand for such a thing. 
There has been no discrimination of any kind in this administration, nor would I stand for that on the part of anyone. And I think that what we have done, if we will get our information from the horse's mouth, our administration, and not from the political rhetoric that has been so prevalent in the last year, I think we can establish that no administration has done more than we have done with regard to any of these people that you speak of, with regard to uh, women, uh, I think our appointments themselves, but I think more than that. No government, no administration has ever done what we have done in the government itself, but everything that we have done, we haven't done anything that in any way discriminated against any of those people. We have done things that we think are helpful. The leadership conference of just which met this past week said that you are uh, the greatest opponent to civil rights as a president in the last um, two decades. And they gave very specific showing that your policies are attempting to reverse the civil rights gains. And now these, these grass right, um, grassroots people believe that you have been blaming the leaders and Brad Reynolds has been blaming the uh, media. But aren't you underestimating the intelligence of the grassroots people if you think that they don't know what they're suffering from? And um, this is going to be, isn't this going to really cause a division in this country rather than a unified country unless you can convince these people who are the victims of these policies, if you can convince them that their conditions are better, then you're working to a disunity. Country, well, you? I think the reduction in inflation certainly has got to help people. I'm sure you're talking about people at the lower end of the earning scale. Uh, our tax policies have been more beneficial to them uh, than to anyone else. This idea that we hear on Capitol Hill all the time that our tax programs benefited the rich, the figures belie that. The people in the upper income brackets are paying a greater percentage of the overall income tax than they were paying before our tax program went into effect. The people at the bottom of the scale are paying less, a lower percentage. But now, on the other point, the inference that programs of a welfare nature, social programs and benefits, have been reduced to the place that people dependent on them uh, are now suffering. That is not true. We are helping more people and paying more money than ever in the history of this country in all of those social programs. The government is providing 95 million meals a day. I could go on with the others. Some of the things that have led perhaps to confusion is taken something like the educational programs. We found out that people were eligible when we came here for college grants and loans for their children uh, and their income level was too high for this to be, to be warranted. So yes, we changed the income level, but this allowed us to increase further down to the people with real need and do more for them. For example, we probably eliminated 850,000 people from food stamps, but we increased the number of people who were getting food stamps because we transferred this from people who were at a higher level. Our level now of income or most of these programs, if not all, is 130% of the poverty level. You, if you're below that, you are eligible. And most families uh, would find themselves eligible for three or four of the programs at the same time. And it is a falsehood that is being purveyed to people that their problems, whether through unemployment or whatever, uh, look at what we've done by the increase in unemployment. And granted, that blacks in this country had a higher rate of unemployment than whites in the time of the recession, their rate of recovery is faster than the rate of recovery for whites. Thank you. Thank you. Are you willing to separate the job program, the summer job program from the Nicaragua aid, COVID aid? Yeah, I want both of these programs. I want jobs for the young, young people, I want summer jobs, and I want the Drink your wine yet? Or some in wine. Do you drink it? No. I'm aging. Okay. Keep aging it.